Well, as we draw to the close of this recollection, I'd like to begin reading uh, from the uh, from the Gospel of Saint Luke, uh, where he speaks the following words. And there were in the same country shepherds watching and keeping the night watches over their flock. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the brightness of God shone around them, and they feared with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy that shall be to all people. For this day is born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord in the city of David. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men of good will. And it came to pass after the angels departed from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and let us see this word that has come to pass, which the Lord hath shown to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in the manger. And seeing, they understood of the word that had been spoken to them concerning this child. And all that heard wondered, and at those things that were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these words, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. And it was told unto, as it was told unto them. This very important passage, but often overlooked and overshadowed by all the events in sacred scripture, we see a very, very powerful testimony to men of prayer. The shepherds were watching. And they were keeping the night watches over their flock. They were keeping a guard over their senses, custody of the eyes, silence. Keeping the night watches, they were praying. And behold, an angel stood by them, just like with Mary, who was praying. These simple shepherds of no importance to anyone were the only ones awake at that moment. The angel stood by them. Prayer, communication with the divine. Now if you look at Jacob, when he fell asleep and he had his head on a rock, and we see the angels ascending and descending upon that rock of Jacob. These, they were bringing prayers to heaven. So here we have an angel doing the same thing, bringing a message to the shepherds. For this day is born to you, Scripture says. To you? For this day is born to you. He isn't born to Mary. Well, obviously, yes, born to Mary, but to you. To you also, he's telling the shepherds on that very morning. He's yours. This child is born to you. Then Scripture tells us something interesting that the shepherds say to themselves. Let us see this word that has come to pass. Now we know that Christ is seen as the word, the word of God. But as we saw before, those who live amidst the noise can't receive the word of God. They can't hear it because they're too occupied. There's too much noise. The senses are too involved in things. But God wants to communicate himself to us just as he did to those shepherds on that Christmas morning. You see, they were silent. They were watching. And they were keeping the night watches over the flock. This is how God could communicate to them. Not only one angel, but he sent a whole army. And the shepherds remembered this. Now let us look at another group of men who also came to the Christ child. They were following a star. Now, they followed this star, which they understood as something divine. And they came to Christ and finding the Christ child. But Scripture tells us that they returned another way. They didn't go back the way that they originally came from. Now, the church fathers tell us here that they returned by the way of faith. 
because they had seen Christ. Now they went down a road that they had never traveled on, something that might have been strange to them, but they didn't come or they didn't go back the way that they came in. They returned by another way. Now the life of prayer, the life of holiness, involves faith, involves dark nights, it involves a journey. But it's a way that the world doesn't know. And it's a way that might confuse us on the road too. Because it's something that is going, that is something we've never experienced before. We experience by the senses and everything according to nature. But when we start to grow in holiness, God takes us to a different level. And He starts to communicate to us supernaturally. It's a different way. A way we don't know, we're not familiar with. But a way that we will find peace and there will be comfort. Now today we're going to look at the three ages of the interior life. The reason why we're doing this today is because we looked at silence. We looked at prayer. We looked at Christ coming to the birth in the soul of those that want to become holy. But then now we're going to look at the journey that is involved in this becoming holy. What are all the things involved? Now many times we think that we can go to Mass, go to Confession, go to Holy Communion. That's it. That's all we really need to become holy, to become saints. It's much more than that. That's why we've been talking about prayer. We've been talking about silence. There is a whole supernatural world out there that we don't know about until we start going down the roads of prayer, until we start going down the roads of the supernatural, and then we start to experience the different ages of the spiritual life, this great mystery that God has planned for us that's hidden from the world, and we will not know it unless we go down that road. We can read about it. We can pick up St. John of the Cross, read about the three ages. It doesn't mean anything until we go down that road. Then we start understanding what he's speaking about because there's a great journey that God wants to take us. So we're doing this to see what lies ahead in the soul's journey to God. It's an adventure that God has set up for our sanctity. So it's going to involve many things, but in the end, true love and interior peace. And as Father had spoken earlier, the greatest is doing the will of God. Prayer gets us to do the will of God. And as we look at St. John of the Cross on the mountain, on the ascent of Mount Carmel, on this is done the will of God. On the peak of this mountain is done the will of God. So we'll start looking at the ways of the interior life. Now the interior life, the three ages are the following. The first, the purgative, it's for the beginners in the spiritual life, normally known as spiritual childhood. And in here we do the active purgation of the senses or the dark night of the senses and also a passive purgation of the senses. Now all this means is that when we're going through this, we're actually learning to deny ourselves, to do sacrifices so that we're not attracted to the things of the world. Remember, we're trying, trying to cut down the noise in the world. We're trying to deny our thing, ourselves things that attract us in the world so that we do reduce that interior noise in us. That's the active part where we actually do the thing. But then there's a passive part that God himself provides for us. So he starts giving us a dislike for the things that we used to like. And so it starts, things start to become kind of boring. But that's a good thing. Because we're, we're starting to detach ourselves. And we're starting to appreciate that silence. And it takes away the noise of wanting to go to these things that we once liked. So if we like going to these things that we like, and then all of a sudden we start losing interest in them, They're not a distraction for us anymore. And this is how God does it passively. And then we do it actively by actually working on it. So that's part of the purgative way. Then the illuminative way is once a person is advanced in the spiritual life, uh, it starts to become more proficient in the understanding and the practice of prayer. And so we call this more like a spiritual adolescence. And in this level, we start going through a passive purgation of the spirit, which is actually what St. John of the Cross calls a dark night of the soul. This one's a little bit more difficult because at least with the senses, we kind of know what we like and we dislike. We have certain sadness because we don't appreciate the things that we had before or we start not liking the things that we uh, did like before. But the purgation of the spirit is, start, is where we thought we knew where we were going on the spiritual life. We'd read all the things, you know, the, our, how to practice holiness, prayer, things like that. All of, a sudden we, we, all of a sudden we start going through dryness. We start losing that. 
and we start experiencing, we, I don't feel that consolation I had in prayer anymore. We start losing all of that, and we start realizing, maybe i got to give this up. Maybe I'm not holy. The soul starts to fear because it begins to feel that it's lost God. So this is the passive purgation of the Spirit. Now, obviously, a soul needs to be advanced in the level spiritually to get to that level because God's not going to plunge a soul into that because a soul will lose its faith right away. But it needs to build the spiritual life to get to that point. So when our faith is tested to that degree where we're fearing our eternal damnation in that sense where we think we've done everything, you know, like St. Teresa of uh, the Child Jesus went through that, God will prepare us uh, to get to that point. So obviously we don't want to get through these things too quickly because we're going to end up uh, um, worse off than we, we started. But God takes us through this gently and peacefully. And then finally the third stage is the unitive, that is the perfect And this is where the gifts of the Holy Ghost are operative. So God is just infusing the soul, and the soul is just operating and doing the will of God because it's completely in touch with God. It's completely united with God. That's why it's called the unitive way. And when it's completely united with God, God directs the soul, and it completely understands God's will. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, that God jumps in the purse person kind of takes him over like a, like a puppet or something because we still have free will. But what happens in this is the person is so united to God, it understands exactly what God's will is at every moment. And it, and it does it because the soul is so close to God. And so that's the unitive way and it's the, uh, the way of the perfect. So we'll get into uh, now more of the essential char- characteristics of each of, uh, of the different ways uh, of the spiritual life, the three ages. Uh, So first, the purgative way. Now, the purgative way, this is um, basically beginners. You know, once we start, once we realize, you know, we're in the state of moral sin, we go to holy communion, we go to confession, and we go to holy communion, we start living a a life of grace. So the souls in this uh, this level habitually live in the state of grace and have a desire for perfection. But still, the soul here is going to have attachments to venial sin, and, uh, and are exposed to fall now and then to grievous sins, that is, mortal sin. But beginners live habitually in the state of grace, and so they will struggle uh, successfully against grave temptations, although once in a while they will fall. From here we rule out those who frequently commit mortal sin and do not avoid any of its occasions. So if somebody isn't avoiding occasions of mortal sin, then they're definitely not even gotten to this first level yet if they're not trying to avoid occasions. Because remember, this is the person that's striving for holiness. So they've already got this in mind. Um, also, we have, they have a certain desire for uh, perfection or progress. Even if this desire is still weak or imperfect, they're already in this level. If they have that desire for perfection... But we rule out those who uh, are worldly and whose highest purpose is to avoid mortal sin uh, and then advance no further. So in other words, if somebody's just saying, okay, I'm trying to avoid mortal sin and just, you know, go to, you know, confession, go to communion every once in a while, get to mass and no further, they wouldn't be considered in this level yet because there's no desire for perfection. So that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about the three ages. A person has a desire for perfection. Of course, those in this uh, level will have uh, some attachment to deliberate venial sin and uh, therefore frequently fall into that sin. Uh, but this distinguishes them from souls already advanced along the way of perfection uh, because even those that are advanced in perfection, they may commit venial sins, but they're not, they're not willful. I mean, they're, they'll, they'll fall into them, but it's not going to be deliberate. There's not going to be uh, a serious deliberation behind it. But those in the beginning stages will uh, commit deliberate venial sins. And uh, they will have these attachments, and these and attachments to things in the world and venial sins are uh, because of the passions have not yet been quieted yet. Ha- they haven't been subdued yet, so we're still moved by the passions. So those in this category usually yield to temptations of sensuality, of pride, of vanity, anger, envy, jealousy, uh, and a lack of charity in word and deed. And so that's basically um, the purgative way. But there's also a few uh, different categories within this. Um, there's the innocent souls that are those that des- desire to grow uh, to grow spiritually, and uh, they've never they've never really fallen into uh, mortal sin, but they just have this desire, so they're they're just beginning on the road. Then there's the converts, those who have uh, grievously sinned in life, but return to God with all sincerity. And who, in order to withdraw further from the brink of uh, mortal sin, want to press forward in the ways of perfection. So that's another category right there, the converts, those that, you know, really want to come back and live a holy and a perfect life. 
Now, here, these are actually the more numerous, but um, we would get a lot more, uh, St. Thomas says, if uh, confessors would remind them that, uh, if, you know, re- remind souls that not to advance is to fall back. And so those that have lived a rough life before and have converted, they need to constantly be ad- advancing. Otherwise, they'll fall into the next category that we fall into, and that's called the lukewarm. And those that, uh, those that are lukewarm are ones that have given themselves once to God. And they, uh, they desire to advance in the ways of perfection. They may even get far in the ways of perfection. But then they fall into a state of a remissness or tepidity where they just kind of like, it's kind of boring. Uh, the desire isn't there and they start backtracking. They start giving up the habits of prayer and so they become lukewarm. Now these, even if they've reached the level of the illuminative way, they need to return to the austere practices of the purgative way. That is, doing penances, sacrificing, denying, uh, denying the passions. So those are the three, uh, the three types right there. There's the, uh, the innocent, the first, the, uh, that start off as little children, then the converts, those that have sinned and come back, and then the lukewarm. But then there's going to be uh, two classes of generosity. There's going to be those in this stage that have a, a greater generosity of wanting to become perfect, and then those with a lesser generosity, but they're still on the level of beginners. Now, those with the lesser generosity are souls that have good desires, are faithful to recite some prayers, but who are taken up with the world and their minds are still absorbed with a thousand different thoughts. And, of course, the devil is going to make constant suggestions and easily conquers them by the passions. Now, there's a certain attachments to pleasures and then even to honor, like human respect. And uh, these are an easy link for falling. So the devil uses these means to tempt us. And that's one of the things that we do want to uh, realize is that our passions, our attachments, these types of things, those are the means the devil uses to tempt us, to get us to fall. Now, even those of less generosity, even though they do avoid sin, they still strive to harmonize piety and worldliness. So they try to do both. They try to live in the world and they try to be pious. It's kind of like you try to walk uh, two lines. Now, of course, we do have to live in the world. But like St. Paul says, live in the world but not of the world. You know, So we still have that detachment from it. But yeah, those, those with the lesser generosity still want to live in, in both camps. They do not realize the need of frequent prayer. They don't realize the need of penance and mortification. But they still want to work out their salvation without making uh, much sacrifice. So those, those are the souls of lesser generosity in the beginning stage. But then those of greater generosity as beginners. Those are the souls initiated in the practice of mental prayer. So just as Father earlier went over the steps of mental prayer and how to do that, that's a very, very valuable thing. So the souls that are initiated in this practice of mental prayer and actually begin doing it are, are considered in, the, in those of greater generosity on the beginning stages. They understand the necessity of sacrifice as a means for perfection, but who, through lack of courage, retreat uh, to the first mansion, that is one of the first steps, uh, exposing themselves again to occasions of sin. But even though they still love the pleasures of the world, uh, they still hear a call to penance, and then they'll come back to penance every once in a while. So that's those of greater generosity. They do understand uh, the need for penance and the desire for it, but many times they'll back out of the, the penances that they've already begun. These souls occasionally fall into grave faults, uh, mortal sins, uh, but still they want to come back and they want to be more generous. Now the virtues or the initial virtues of beginners are the first degree of charity, temperance, chastity, patience, and the first degrees of humility. And on this stage is where we actually begin the act of purification of the senses. This is where we actually start giving up things ourselves. That's why Lent is so important. Lent kind of puts us into a a situation where we give up things. You know, we start sacrificing and we start learning to deny our senses. And the church does this every year, you know, the 40 days of Lent. It puts us through that so we actually start or have that desire to begin doing penance and to detach ourselves from the things of the world. It's funny how even after Lent, when Easter shows up, you know, after we've given stuff up, if we go back to the things that we had given up, like we look forward to maybe that chocolate or whatever, but once we get back to it, it wasn't that good, you know? And you're like, why is this? You know, and you kind of experience that frustration. Well, you've experienced a detachment from it. So there is that freedom that you've gotten, and it doesn't have that same noise, if you want to call it, or that same attachment, because that's what this, uh, this sacrifice does. So this is the act of purification of the senses, where we start giving ourselves over to mortification and denying ourselves certain things. And then the way of prayer is the um, acquired prayer, 
where we actually go in before God, we do our mental prayer, we spend time, but we do a lot of thinking. A lot of the thinking is ours. Um, a lot of the recollection uh, becomes ours. There's going to be times in there where we experience God, but a lot of a lot of the times it's going to be our efforts, and we're going to we're going to sense that, and that's going to be in the uh, beginning stages. So then we get to the illuminative way, which is the second uh, the second way, where souls that are more advanced in the spiritual life. Now, usually the souls in this level have gone through uh, mortification of the senses. You know, now it doesn't mean they're completely senseless. They don't feel any joy, pleasure, or anything like that. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that there's no attachment. You know, we still, you know, you, uh, someone will still experience a good meal, but they won't sit there and go, "Boy, that was a good meal. I like seconds and thirds until they get full." You know, that would be someone more on the uh, on the lower levels. But a per, uh, you know, in the beginning stages, but someone in the illuminative way will eat, enjoy it does not need any more, and there's perfect control of the passions. But in this way, they have an intense desire of not offending our Lord. They don't want to offend God for any reason whatsoever. Now, souls on this uh, stage will uh, commit sins, although they will try to avoid, they will avoid uh, uh, venial sins as much as possible. They begin to have a love for penance. They spend long hours of recollection, and they employ their time usefully And they perform acts of charity towards their neighbor. That's the key right there, charity. If there's no charity, it's hard to be actually stay in this, uh, in this level. And that means a kindness, charity towards others, towards our neighbor, towards God. Now everything about them is in perfect order. But there's three conditions, uh, for the illuminative way. The first is a purity of heart. The soul on this stage has to have a certain purity of heart. Now they must Energetically avoid occasions of sin. That's what we mean by purity of heart. We fight against or combat tendencies of nature, and we resist temptations. You know, we fight against the temptations. We're successful for the most part. When one reaches this level, they're actually working on the positive side of virtue. You know, a lot of times we're just looking at our sins. We're going through a list of examination of conscience and trying to avoid sins, and uh, and that's what we go to confession for, which is absolutely a good thing. But when we get to this stage, we're actually looking to practice the virtues. I want to be temperate. I want to do this. So we see things in a very positive light, and that's what we want to advance towards. So that's uh, that's a purity of heart. Now, the soul on this stage uh, really begins to abhor deliberate venial sin, doesn't want to commit any sin at all. Of course, the soul will still fall, and so the soul will experience a tremendous pain in just committing venial sin. Now, the second condition in the illuminative way is uh, the soul mortifies its passions. Now, it's determined to fight against the passions and the capital sins uh, in order, you know, to, that, uh, so that we get the self-control over uh, these passions so that we can practice the positive side of virtue. And then recollection of self is at work. And then we devote our, our time uh, to the fulfillment of our duties in state. So we start to fulfill our duties of state perfectly. This is, uh, this is one of those conditions. Now, of course, there's, a, there's an example uh, that we'd had in seminary about this. You know, uh, say, you know, a woman who's raising a child, you know, and spends all their time in prayer but neglecting their children. You know, they're not getting an education. They're not eating. They're not doing all these things. But they're spending all these hours in prayer. They're not on this level. They're probably on the beginner stage. There's a desire there but they're not fulfilling their duties of state, which means they're not going to get to this level of the illuminative way. So we have to fulfill our state in life to get to this level. So mothers have to be good mothers. Fathers have to be good fathers. You know, priests have to be good priests. We have to fulfill our duties. That's basically what we have to do to get to the illuminative way. And it has to be done out of the desire for charity. We have to focus it on, on that reason for God. Then the, uh, the next uh, condition, the third condition, is the, um, the illuminative soul has a profound conviction on all truths. In other words, we're able to give more time to devout affections and petitions, and uh, we believe those things that we're taught. You know, we don't question the things of Scripture. You know, we believe those things that are being taught by the church, especially when it comes to prayer. We don't question those things. We don't argue if somebody's telling us that we have to mortify our passions to grow in holiness. Well, that's it. You know, we're going to get upset about this and maybe go to the bishop on that one, whatever we have to do, because somebody's telling us we have to do a little bit of mortification, you know. God forbid. But the thing is, we could see that you're probably not in this level if you're protesting too loud on these. But we have a profound, profound conviction of what all the saints before us, before have taught us, that we actually have this desire for holiness and we know the means to get there, and so we actually want to follow them. So we're truly convicted that these are the things that are going to help us to get to heaven. Now the souls that are progressing in the life of perfection 
are recognized by these two principal signs. Now, the first one's going to sound kind of funny, but we experience great difficulty in prayer um, and making uh, prayer in a discursive manner. So if we experience great difficulty in prayer, it's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. But in the sense that if we're willfully distracting ourselves, you know, like we talked about the noise, you know, listening to rock music on the way to church, you know, or uh, having watched a TV show the night before and it's influencing your prayer, I would say you're not on the stage yet on that on those premises. But it, what I mean by the difficulty is that there's um, you, you've come, you've prepared yourself properly, you've done all the things, just as Father had mentioned in, uh, in doing mental prayer, and it's dry. Nothing happens, you know, and you look, have I, have I caused this? Have I been listening to things? Have I been filling my mind with all kinds of noise? Am I angry with other people? You know, am I distracted by things? Um, have I forgiven faults? Uh, is my imagination working? Is my memory? Do I have custody of my senses? And if I, if I look at those and I say, well, I'm, I'm really working on those and I'm, I'm doing mortification there. Well, then you could say, well, God is permitting this dryness. It's because God is actually raising the soul to the next level of prayer. Now, this is something we don't recognize because God is very peaceful. Remember, he works in silence. And so God is going to work where we don't recognize him. Because say we do recognize this thing. We're like, hey, yeah, this is great. I'm getting to the illuminative way. And then all of a sudden we start falling into pride because we think we're, we're getting higher. And then God doesn't want us to fall into that. So we realize that uh, we're weak. And we realize that we need God's help. And so the soul becomes more and more reliant on God because God actually takes the soul in prayer. You know, we think that our prayers and our efforts are going to make us holy. Part of it, yes, but not entirely. Because to get to heaven, to get to the supernatural, somebody's got to make up the difference between natural where we are and supernatural where God is. So somebody has to get us there, and that's going to be God. So we can be doing all these things, but if there's pride and there's other things involved, God's not going to pull us up. But it's when we're doing everything, we're completing our duties, we're fulfilling everything to please God, then God's going to see that. Our prayer will be dry, but he's calling us higher to a, to a higher form of prayer. Now, so the Holy Ghost then gives us less time to considerations and more to affections and petitions. And it's at this time that, um, you know, a spiritual director would recognize this to say, um, okay, this person, you're going through this. What I would say is just put the book aside maybe and then go before God and then just uh, just speak to him one-on-one. You know, start to put the uh, uh, the, the things from, um, you know, that you're used to leaning on, uh, start putting those aside. Of course, that'll be... Um, That'll come from the director, you know, when, when you're experiencing these things and then you're told to do that. Now, of course, things, you can go back and forth. You can actually advance and then fall back. And, and so the soul isn't like, it's not like you get to a step and then, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go to the next one, you know. You can, you go that way, but the thing is you can also fall back too when we, uh, when we neglect the spiritual life. Now, the principles that, uh, that show the difference between those in the purgative, that is the beginning and the illuminative way, are, uh, are the following. There's two, there's things that are similar. They both have effort and struggle, that's for sure. But the beginners struggle against sin and its causes, while souls, uh, who have progressed struggle to adorn themselves with God's virtues. In other words, the soul is trying to make itself more pleasing to God. Yes, it's, it's already gotten past the stage where it's worried about sin. You know, it's still, yes, it still goes to confession and everything like that. We always have to go to confession, even, even in the unitive way. But the soul starts to see, um, that uh, it wants to practice more and more Christ's virtues. It wants to be more like Christ. It wants to imitate him. And it starts to see him more and more because the mental prayer has painted that picture of Christ in his mind and made him so desirable to the soul that the soul wants to be like him. And so now the soul starts to want to be like him, starts to imitate his virtues, and starts to see how it can be more and more like Christ. And that becomes the soul's desire, not so much to avoid sin. And, okay, i got to go to confession, i got to do this. He's, he has the desire. And, yes, when the soul falls, that's why the soul is so upset set when it falls in this level is because oh, I've, I've offended God and I, you know, I want to be more like him, but I keep falling back. And so the soul has more of that type of uh, approach in the illuminative way where it, it just has that desire for Christ's virtues. Now, the purgative, those in the uh, purgative way look at virtue in sort of a negative way, you know, what sins to avoid so that I can get there. But the illuminative way looks at virtue in a positive way, you know, how to advance in virtue. Now, by entering the illuminative way, one doesn't cease from practicing penance and mortification, but has to continue practicing it because those things help keep the passions in check and they help keep that silence of soul to actually help us in prayer. Now, those souls in the illuminative way are characterized by what we call effective prayer. Now, the prayer 
isn't so much in thought anymore, in thinking through all these things. But the per, the soul just goes and it senses its presence with God. It can speak to Him, you know, just as Father had mentioned the colloquy, where the soul is making acts of the will, and it just experiences that presence and the love of Christ, and it can return that love of Christ uh, very intimately. Now, sometimes in the beginning stages, we will have that consolation. It does, and and so there's a temptation there for the soul to think. Whoa! I'm in the unitive way. I feel the, the, I feel all these consolations, and they and what happens is the, the soul thinks that they're very, very holy, and then because they've put themselves in the wrong category, they end up saying, "Well, I don't need to do this," and, and they start enjoying things a little too much, and that's where the devil sets the trap to kind of throw the things of the world back in, and the person starts enjoying everything, and it starts to feel that consolation is the way of holiness when consolation isn't the way of holiness. Remember, we're looking the, to the God of consolations, not the consolations of God. We have to look for God himself. So sometimes God takes those away so that we can find him, not just uh, the joys of the spiritual life, because there will be dryness, but we need to find God. And so we always have to look at that. You know, we always have to say, is this what God is calling me to? And this is why, you know, we always keep our mind focused on God. We complete our duties and we always uh, continue in mental prayer. That's why mental prayer is so important. And that's why it was, uh, we, we devoted a whole talk in today's uh, recollection. Because mental prayer is going to be the key to get through all these levels of the, of the uh, you know, of, uh, of the three ages of the interior life. Because if we don't have that, We'll be stuck at beginners our whole life, and I don't want you there. I want you to become holy. I want you to become saints. I want to go with you, too, so that I have to do my duty and fulfilling my duties in the state of life. That's what we want to do. So we have to become holy, and we have to look at mental prayer as something so important and vital for our spiritual life. And then the prayer starts to take life in the soul. What do I mean by prayer taking life in the soul? Well, the things that we've prayed the things that we meditate on, all of a sudden we start seeing things that God has revealed to us in prayer. All of a sudden something happened in, in, in our day and we look at that and we say, you know, that reminds me of this time that God is speaking to this to me. You know, or maybe uh, if someone was reciting a psalm like, the, you know, the sisters or, or someone who's reading a psalm and then that psalm is so applicable and God keeps using that psalm over and over in our mind during that day and we start seeing how it's applied to our life. Well, this is how God's speaking to us constantly. And so the illuminative way has this very aspect of God enlightening the soul. So the soul in the illuminative way is what we call, or actually what uh, Father Gary Goulagrange calls, on the threshold of the mystical life. It's ready to go uh, to the highest. So it, it has to go through this uh, level of the illuminative way. But it has uh, very solid virtues. Uh, it goes to the second degree of charity, which is a higher form of charity. Um, obedience, uh, more profound humility. A soul that's very disobedient is not in this level. Uh, a soul that's obedient is in this level. That's usually obedience is a very good indicator. Um, there's a more profound humility, uh, and then there's a spirit of the councils. The gifts of the Holy Ghost begin to manifest themselves more and more, uh, especially the three um, interior gifts, uh, those of fear, of knowledge, and piety. Now, why fear? Well, the reason why fear is part of the soul is because, as we said before, it, it, we have a fear of offending God, and it has so much love for God that it has that fear of offending God. That's the true gift of fear right there, where we fear to offend God because we love Him. And that's one of the keys uh, to the illuminative, uh, illuminative way. So it's not a cowering fear, but it's a fear of not being like Christ because the soul wants so much to be like Christ. And prayer brings that to the soul. Prayer brings Christ to the soul. Now then the soul becomes more docile. It profits more from inspirations and interior illuminations. We can sense the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Sometimes we just know what to do. The Holy Spirit is guiding us, and then we do it. If we neglect the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, a lot of times we're going to start losing that, and He's going to speak to us less and less because we're not following through on that. You know, sometimes you may think, oh, you know, I should probably, uh, you know, put that cigarette down. You know, ah, but I'm going to pick it up again and do it. You know, and so what happens is you put down an inspiration. Well, God's not obliged uh, to do it again and to bring that inspiration, so we may start losing that. That's why it's very good to always follow the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. And of course, we're not 100% perfect. You know, that's why we have confession. You know, and that's why there are erasers on pencils, because we're not 100% perfect, and God knows that. But as long as the will is there, remember earlier, peace on earth to men of good will. 
That's what was said to the shepherds, because there were men of good will. They wanted to do what was right, and they wanted to follow. They followed the inspirations of the angel. They told them, the angel told them about Christ is born to you, and so they followed the inspirations of the angel. And this is why they got to see Christ, because they were watching. And this is more an example of the illuminative way, the shepherds that we read earlier. Then comes a prayer of supernatural recollection, and the prayer recalled quiet where the soul just finds itself in silence and peace. It's the initial infused prayer. It's God infusing prayer into the soul. And so there's going to be isolated acts of infused contemplation, uh, and also there's going to be times of acquired contemplation. And all that means is there's going to be times where we're making the efforts, but there's other times where God is actually going to be moving the soul in that mental prayer. And so that... uh, Supernatural recollection of quiet is very important for the illuminative way. There's an example of that. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the life of St. John Vianney uh, or the reading life of St. John Vianney, where there was a, an old farmer. He was, uh, you know, he was kneeling down, and uh, St. John Vianney used to see him every day kneeling down, you know, and, and he'd go up to him and say, uh, you know, what do you say to, the, to our Lord? You know, because he was so inspired by his piety and devotion. And the simple little man said, nothing. I look at him. He looks at me. That's the prayer of quiet. So this soul, simple farmer, was in it was in the illuminative way, at least in the illuminative way, because he had that prayer of quiet where it was just him and God, and he didn't have a book, he didn't have it. It was just you know. And I'm not saying, oh, okay, we want to advance in holiness, I'm going to throw my book out and stuff like that. No, don't do that. You know, keep following the book, you know, because you're going to need that help. You know, we need to have that help, and we need to have that crutches. Unless your spiritual director says, okay, start putting it aside, then don't start putting it aside till you hear that. Because you need that. We all need that, you know. We all need to have something to fall back on. Even St. Teresa of Avila, who had reached the great levels of the mystical way, had always taken a book with her to prayer. And then the final stage is the unitive way. Now this one is a habitual and intimate union with God through Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual marriage. It's where Christ himself imposes himself on the soul. The soul experiences a union with Christ. St. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, said the following, The first and last aim of this institution, that is the church, is to live supremely unto God. I, Christ Jesus, our Lord, so that our inmost hearts may be penetrated with the interior dispositions of the Son of God, and each may be able to say what St. Paul truly said of himself, I live now, not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's what we're trying to do, is trying to be Christ. That's what unitive way is, a spiritual marriage. When a couple is married, they start to resemble each other. And it's funny, after they've been married for many, many years, they start looking like one another, you know. But it's, I mean, even on the physical level. But the funny thing is, is that marriage brings to union. So you start doing things the same way. You start saying the same things, you know. And uh, and so there's there's a union that way. With Christ, it's no different. There's a marital union, but God, Christ isn't going to become like us. You know, he's not going to have faults or anything like that. We've got to become like him. So there's going to be a spiritual marriage from our side. He's the perfect side of the spouse. If there's a marriage, a spiritual marriage, he's the perfect spouse. We're kind of like, you know, we're the ones that have to fix ourselves. You know, so he's, he's the perfect spouse. So we have to become like Christ. Christ liveth in me. Our first and the last aim is to live supremely unto God. Now, there's a, um, a false devotion out there that I do want to bring up. It is called the Divine Will, Louisa Picaretti. Um, and it, it, it goes along this, and it says you can get to this Divine Will or this Unitive Way very, very quickly, you know, by uniting yourself through these uh, formula of prayer. But it's not a short step. You have to go through the long journey, as the Church says. So the Church has not approved of this. In fact, there's many, many who have condemned it. Um, and, and so, um, yes, please uh, do not follow this. Uh, this isn't a quick way there. The the way to heaven is slow, time-consuming, and it's a journey. Now, St. Augustine says, love and do what you will. Now, this can be understood when you get to the unitive way. You know, sometimes people think on a lower level, they think something else. They say, uh, you know, love and do what you will, but people don't understand what love is. They think love on the, you know, on the natural level. St. Augustine is saying, love and do if you will. And what he says, love and do what you will, if you love God then everything that you do, everything you do because you love God, out of that love will be God's holy will. So 
We get to that point, though, through prayer, through sacrifice, through penance, and through getting through all these stages so that we can love God truly. Now, there's one, uh, the commandment in the Satanic Bible says, do what thou wilt, and that shall be the whole of the law. So how do you, con- how do you look at these two? St. Augustine saying, love and do what you will. And then the Satanic Bible saying, do what thou wilt, thou shalt be the whole of the law. But remember, if we love, then we want to be like Christ. And if we want to be like Christ, that is our love right there. And so that love makes us like Christ, so we do God's will. And that's all we want to do. That is true love, doing God's will. But the Satanic Bible is doing your own will. That's what it's all about, just doing my will. So you want to go one way, do what I want to do. You want to go the other way, you do what God wants you to do. But that's the whole thing in the, in the unitive way is that the soul is so completely united to God. It does God's holy will. It is so inspired by, by Christ and he's so close to him. And the most blessed trinity is indwelling in these souls most closely. And this soul is moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, when we're practicing virtues on the lower levels, that is the uh, the beginning and the illuminative way, it's kind of like, um, you know, uh, guys on a boat that they're rowing. You know, they're moving with oars. They're doing the work themselves, trying to grow on the virtues, saying, okay, i got to avoid this, i got to avoid that. When the soul gets to the unitive way and it has the gifts of the Holy Ghost, then it's like the sails of a ship where the wind blows, the Holy Spirit blows, over the, over the soul, and it moves the soul, and the soul is guided by the wind of the Holy Ghost. This soul lives in silence and in peace. This soul is in perfect peace because it's the wind of the Holy Ghost that's guiding it. Remember, God is not found in the earthquake, but in the gentle breeze, and this is where God is found. Now, in this level, there's eminent and heroic virtues, the third degree of charity, the highest charity, doing all things for the love of Christ, in spite of what others do to the soul, what, in spite of what others say about it. The soul doesn't care what people think or say about it. The soul only wants to do acts of charity. Even though if people misjudge that charity, oh, I'll bet you he's doing it for this, you know, oh, he's just, uh, you know, trying to get an advantage in this. It doesn't matter if the soul is doing it for Christ. Love and do what you will, as St. Augustine says. The soul is perfect in humility. There's a great spirit of faith, of abandonment, and there's the most unalterable patience. The soul on this level is completely patient. That's a big one. So, anyway, so those are those are good indicators of the unitive way. Now, in this, obviously, the gifts of the Holy Ghost predominate. So, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the, the Holy Ghost is actually going to be moving uh, the soul. Now, God helps us in two different ways. He acts um, like on a human mode, you know, where we're actually practicing the virtues and we make the efforts. That's what we call acquired virtue. But then there's also the passive virtue where God acts in us and he infuses the virtue and infuses the grace for us. Well, in this unitive way, that grace has been infused. And so the Holy Spirit is just moving us by the grace that he's already given us. But it's also new graces and new actual graces that he gives. And because the soul responds to them, then the soul will receive more graces. But this is also where the virtue of gratitude is so important. And I'm not speaking just on this level, but on all of them. We have to be thankful to God for everything that he's given to us. After we pray, we should always thank God. Every time something good happens, we should thank God. Every time something bad happens, we should thank God. Remember Job where he says, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the Lord. So one blessed be God in a time of suffering, in a time of adversity, is more is, is greater than all the thanksgiving we can give in the times of greatest joy because we're actually overcoming our will. So the Holy Ghost in this stage helps us to seek the best means to achieve our end. He's always focusing us on our final end. He gives us actual graces and leaves us free to take the initiative according to the dictates of prudence and light by faith. So a soul is very free and it knows what it's doing is right. It has a a certain surety and a stability to the soul. That's why that soul is at peace. It's not wondering, did I, did it, was I right when I did this? Did I do this? Was that right? The soul in the unitive way does not second guess itself because the soul knows this is pleasing to God. Even though what others might say, the soul just knows this is pleasing to God and the soul's gonna do it. Doesn't matter what other people think. But by means of the gifts, God acts in a way above human nature. 
Because God himself has taken the initiative in the soul. He sends divine intuitions, lights, and actions. And a lot of times, uh, they're without deliberation on our part, but never without our consent. We don't even debate it. We just do it. The more passive, in this case, the, the, uh, the graces are more passive than active uh, in the mode of reception. So we just receive the graces, and then it's like we automatically do it. I mean, it's, there's nothing automatic about it because our will is involved, but the soul is so close to Christ, it knows exactly what Christ wants, and it wants to fulfill God's will perfectly. Then we allow ourselves to be led by the Holy Ghost according to our habits and dispositions, and we start strengthening those habits. Now this gets us to the summit where we perfectly fulfill God's holy will. When we look at the, um, the image that St. John of the Cross drew on Mount Carmel, only the will of God rests here. And if you look at all the other things, you know, not this, not that, you know, not these things of the world, even not the things of the Spirit, because at that point you're not striving anymore for virtue, even though because you have it. You're striving to do God's holy will. All you do is you see God's holy will and you want to do it. Sort of like what we heard today in the reading at, uh, at the table, where the soul desires to do God's will and it abandons itself entirely to do God's will. Then all the virtues will come. All those other things will happen. But the soul wants to do God's holy will. Now the characteristics of this way are the intimate union with God through charity. Like St. John of the Cross says, in the evening of life we will be judged on how much we have loved. So love is the key. Charity is the key. Like St. Paul says, if I had faith to move mountains, but I have not charity, I'm nothing. He says, if I have all these things, he was even talking about faith. If I have faith to move mountains, I'm nothing if I don't have charity. Which means the simple little soul who will not be able to move a mountain, if he has great charity, he is holier than anyone who can move a mountain. That's what St. Paul is saying. Charity. Obviously, since the detraction, calumny, all that stuff is way out. I mean, that's way past. That should be way before the beginning stages. All the soul has is charity. The soul lives in a continual presence of God. The soul senses God. When the soul walks from place to place, it feels God's presence with it. It has a peace and a stability. It doesn't need to get in the car, turn on the radio, you know, because there's no desire for that, because it'll take God away from the soul. The soul has no desire for that anymore. The soul walks above this world. The soul starts building a sanctuary in the, in the soul where it has more and more heart-to-heart talks with God, and it just speaks to him as a friend who's living there. And the soul is fully present, is fully aware that God is present there in the soul. But the love of God is the principal characteristic of this uh, level. Now, this soul will have trials, will have sorrows. It doesn't just have a moment of this great consolation. It has trials and sorrows. But because the soul knows that these trials are very beneficial, those trials are part of the stability, part of the faith, and part of the peace that brings the soul. Because the soul then realizes... I'm suffering. Something must be going right. And so it has an appreciation for suffering. It doesn't look at suffering in a bad way like i got to run away from this. It sees the suffering as something that is going to be so helpful to the soul, and so the soul welcomes it. The soul has a greater purity of heart. It has a detachment from whatever might lead it to sin. It has a great mastery over itself. And like we said, the, the soul is constant. It's in a constant need of thinking of God. It always has to be thinking of God. And so the real suffering is experienced when the soul isn't able to be constantly occupied with the thought of God. Now, this doesn't strictly apply to monks and to nuns. Anyone can become holy. In fact, St. Francis de Sales, when he writes his book, he speaks of the ver- that very thing. He says, this isn't confined to, to monasteries. What he talks about in the introduction to a devout life is the way for the faithful. That's what he talks about. And there's no way that any of you here, I mean, there's, there's, you should be able to get to the unitive way. If you do all things and God is calling you and you respond to God's graces. So this is a very important thing to see. The three different stages of the interior life. Now this is a great adventure. 
Now, this shouldn't discourage us, you know, because sometimes you may think, oh, I'm only at the beginning stages, or maybe I just started the beginning stage like a, maybe 10 minutes ago or half hour ago, whenever it was, and I just decided to get, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become holy today. Even if I just made that commitment right now and I just entered on the beginning stages right now by saying that, we've got a journey ahead of us. You know, we saw how silence was important, how mental prayer was very important. We're all called to the heights of sanctity. But we have to be moved from our heart Man, we have to move it from the interior part of our soul. We have to desire it. We have to want God. Now, if we look at it in reality, that's really what we all should want because we're here to get to heaven. That's what we're here for. We're not here for anything else. But the soul should just say, not not only that, but say, I want God. I want to become holy. I want to become so united with him here in this life so that when I die, it's just a stepping off, like graduation, just stepping off to the next level very easily right into heaven. We're all moved from our heart, from the interior part of our soul, just like Mary, who was humble, silent, hidden, prayerful. She was so full of virtue, especially that virtue of charity. Now, yes, maybe going through this will take time. You know, it's not like McDonald's fast food where you can just go in and order it. It will take time, but more grace than time. Because if we advance very quickly, if we receive many graces, if we follow through on the request of God, and we follow through on the inspirations of the Holy Ghost, we will receive many graces. And it may not take as much time, but we can't do it ourselves. We can't do all the acts. It's not me who's going to make myself holy. We have to relax and let God. We do what we can. God's going to give us the grace to do it. So we have to be at peace. We have to be patient. You know, God's going to do it in His time. I remember there was a thing... uh, I'll just give you a quick thing with the Muppet Show. You know, I don't know if uh, you remember that. Uh, you know, I'll kind of get kind of weird. But the, the Muppet Show, there was one there was one guy who'd play the piano, you know, and uh, he was always trying a new piece, you know, and uh, he, he'd get to a thing and he'd goof it up and he says, I'm never going to get this. And he'd bang his head on the keys of the piano, you know. <laughs> well, advancing the spiritual life, we can't be doing that. You know, it's like, oh, I'm never going to be holy. And then we lose our patience. No, it's a it's a step by step process. You know, we do what we can. If we see we've fallen into sin, we go to confession and we keep on track. We don't lose that. We keep God as our focus. God is going to help us be peaceful. God will reward a generous heart. He's never going to be outdone in generosity, especially when that soul wants to draw more closely to him. Now, sometimes we may not think he's there or even recognize his work in our soul, but we leave that to him and we abandon ourselves entirely to his work. doesn't matter what we're suffering. doesn't matter what we're going through. It must be good. It must be from God. Just like St. Peter, when he saw our Lord on the shore, he said, it is the Lord. Well, if we're suffering and we're receiving those crosses, our Lord loves us very much because he's giving us things that are going to help us. So we should always say it is the Lord who's going to help us. Like Mary and Joseph, they left everything to find the nothing of a stable full of animals. But in this nothing of a place in the eyes of the world, a Savior was born. In the silence of the night, Christ will be born to you, and he will grow in your soul if you watch and pray, just as the shepherds did on that first morning. So I'll close with some very encouraging words of Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene, who said, Oh my God, that in order to find you, I must go forth from all things, go forth from the confusion and turbulence of the exterior life, from the noise of earthly things, from the curiosity which drives me outside to see, to hear, to know. I must go forth by my will from all this exterior world which ever tries to attract my attention thoughts, and affections. Help me to subdue my vain curiosity, my excessive loquacity, conversations. Help me to pass through the vicissitudes of earthly life, its ostentations, attractions, its affairs, its whirling activity, without letting my eyes or my heart rest on these things, seeking for satisfaction, comfort, or personal interest in them. Let us pray to God. Let us ask Him to give us this desire for holiness, this desire to be like Him, this desire to unite us with Him. 
And let us begin this Christmas season giving birth to the Christ child in our soul so we go through all these levels and grow in holiness daily so we come closer and closer to God and truly experience the joys of the spiritual life that God so much wants to give us because he does want to give them to us. All we need to do is just make a little effort.